This is AP Psychology, Chapter 14, Stress and Health. Stress and health is stress and illness, stress and stressors, stress in the heart, stress and the susceptibility to disease, and promoting health, coping with stress. Stress, managing stress, modifying illness, and related behaviors. And then thinking critically about alternative medicine, new ways to health or cold snake oil. Okay, stress psychologically states cause and physical illness. Stress is any circumstance real or perceived that threatens a person's well-being. When we feel severe stress, our ability to cope with it is impaired. Our behavior as well as our exposure to prolonged stress can in increase our susceptibility to serious illness. Health psychology provides psychology's contribution to behavior medicine. Among its concerns are the effects of stress and how to control stress, how our emotions are, and personality influence our risk of disease and the promotion of healthier living. Walter Cannon viewed our response to stress as fight or flight system well, Hans Selye saw it as a three-stage general adaption syndrome. Modern research assesses the health and consequences of various life experiences. Coronary heart disease has been linked with the anger-prone type A personality. Stress may also affect the progression of other serious illnesses, including AIDS and cancer. Several factors affect our ability to cope with stress, including our feelings of personal control, our explanatory style, and our support of connections. Stress management programs include training and aerobic exercise, biofeedback, and relaxation. Although biofeedback can sometimes help control tension headaches and high blood pressure, simple relaxation exercises offer some of the same benefits. Researchers seem to identify intervening variables that link spirituality and health. In attempting to reduce cigarette smoking, psychologists have studied the social influences that motivate adolescents to start smoking and reinforce them maintain the habit. In studying obesity, psychologists have found that a number of physiological factors make it difficult to lose weight permanently. Those who wish to diet should minimize exposure to food cues, boost energy expenditure through exercise, make lifelong change in eating patterns, and set realistic goals. Prolonged stress combined with unhealthy behaviors may increase our risk for one of today's four leading diseases. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, and chronic lung disease. These are the four leading causes of death in the United States today. By studying how our emotions and personality influence our risk of disease, the, the effects of stress and promotion of healthier living, health psychologists contribute to behavioral medicine and, into the, and the interdisciplinary field that integrates behavioral and medical knowledge. Prolonged stress combined with these unhealthy behaviors may increase our risk for one of today's four leading diseases. The Center of Disease Control claimed that half of the deaths in the U.S. are due to people's behavior, smoking, alcoholism, unprotected sex, insufficient exercise, drugs, and poor nutrition. Psychologists and physicians have thus developed an interdisciplinary field of behavioral medicine that integrates behavioral knowledge with medical knowledge. Health psychology is a field of psychology that contributes to behavioral medicine, the field that studies stress-related aspects of disease and asks the following questions. How do emotions and personality influence the risk of disease? What attitudes and behaviors prevent illness and promote health and well-being? How do our perceptions determine stress? And how can we reduce or control str stress? Stress can be adaptive in fearful or stressful causing situation. We can run away and save our lives. Stress can be maladaptive if it is prolonged, such as chronic stress. 
It increases our risk of illness and health problems. Stress is not just a stimulus or a response, rather it is the process by which we appraise and cope with the environmental events. When we perceived as challenges, stressors can arouse and motivate us to conquer problems. When perceived as threats, prolonged stressors can produce overwhelming feelings of anxiety and exhaustion. So stress is a slippery concept. At times it is the stimulus missing in a like a missing an appointment, and at other times it's a response, sweating while taking a test, for instance. Stress is not merely a stimulus or a response. It's a process which we appraise and cope with this environmental threat and challenges. When short-lived or taken as a challenge, stressors may have positive effects. However, if stress is threatening or prolonged, it can be harmful. The stress response system. Walter Cannon observed that in the response to stress, the sympathetic nervous system activates the secretion of stress hormones, triggers increased heart rate and respiration, diverts blood to the skeletal muscles, and releases sugar and fat from the body's stores, all to prepare the body for either fight or flight. In addition to this, first and faster track, the cerebral cortex operates on a slower track by stimulating the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to trigger the release of glucortate stress hormones such as cortisol from the outer parts of the adrenals. In Hans Selye's general adaption syndrome, GAS, the body's adaptive response to stress is composed of three stages. In phase one, we perceive an alarm reaction due to the sudden activation of our sympathetic nervous system. Our heart rate increases and blood is diverted to the skeletal muscles. With our resources mobilized, we then fight the challenge during the phase two resistance. Temperature, blood, pressure, and respiration remain high. There's a sudden outpouring of stress hormones. If the stress is persistent, it may eventually deplete our body's reserve. And during phase three, we enter a period of exhaustion. With exhaustion, we are more vulnerable to illness and even in extreme cases, collapse and death. So we must ask ourselves, do males and females respond different to stress in the same way? Uh, the text notes that one alternative to the fight or flight response, especially among women, is, is uh, what Shelley Taylor and her colleagues call the tend and befriend. When women are more likely than men to seek and give support. Kate Volpe provides a good overview of Taylor's research as follows. The evolutionary significance of the fight or flight response for women is clear. If women fight, they may become injured and unable to care for offspring. Similar, similarly, if they flee, they also leave offspring unprotected and are forced to fend for themselves. The tend and befriend model states that, offspring, uh, that stressed females devote more attention not only to caring for offspring independence, but also to seeking support from others. After conducting a meta-analysis of 26 studies, the researchers found that in all but one case, women sought social support from others in times of stress. The research also suggested that compared to men, women are more likely to turn to other women, such as close friends and relatives, than to turn to their spouses for support. In reviewing the literature for her research, Taylor found one study in which men and women asked women asked to think about their spouses before experiencing a stressful event demonstrated different responses. Although male stress responses decreased, females significantly increased. Other, other lines of research suggest that married women experience higher levels of stress for longer part of each day. Women's autonomic arousal level remains elevated until 10 p.m while men's arousal drops after they leave work. The net effect of marriage on men is very beneficial, Taylor concluded. It is estimated that the death rate of married men is 250% lower 
for a given time period than, than that of unmarried men. However, for women, Taylor stated, marriage is likely to be a wash in terms of health protection. Interviews with both parents and their children suggest that mothers and fathers respond differently to stress. When stressed by work, to work overload, fathers were more likely to show social withdrawal. When stressed by interpersonal conflict, they tend to project their reaction outward by becoming argumentative. In contrast, mothers experiencing stress showed their children more love and affection. Although tending is some Sometimes draining, recent research indicates that those who give support also benefit themselves. Giving social support is not biologically costly, no, noted Taylor. It may actually be helpful as providers are receiving psychological and biological benefits as well. The biological underpinnings for, for tend and support may include the hormone oxytocin that is released in response to stress. In studies with animals injected with oxytocin, reduces anxiety, enhances grooming, and promotes bonding. All tend and befriend behaviors. Because the hormone is enhanced by estrogen and inhibited by androgens, it is considered more influential in women. Stressful life events, catastrophic events, like earthquakes, combat, stress, and flood lead individuals to become depressed, sleepless, and anxious. Those who experience significant life changes, such as the death of a spouse, divorce, or loss of a job, are vulnerable to disease. Experiencing a cluster of such crises puts one at even more at risk. Daily hassles such as rush hour traffic, long lines, the bank or store, and aggravating housemates may be the most significant sources of stress over time. The, um, over time, these stressors take a toll on our health and well-being. During a four-year period, researcher Elon Whitson and his colleagues studied 19 patients who were hospitalized after such shocks. Most were older women in their 60s. One experienced symptoms an, symptoms an hour after narrowly avoiding a car accident. Another fell ill within two hours of being involved in a bitter argument. And a third reported symptoms hours after a surprise party. The grief or fear experienced and stimulated the body to produce adrenaline that stunned the heart muscle, leaving it temporarily unable to contract. The reduced pumping caused chest pain, shortness of breath, and other symptoms similar to heart attack. However, stress cardiomyopathy is not the same thing as a heart attack, which occurs when a blood clot in a coronary artery cuts off circulation to the heart muscle. According to researchers, shortly after the patients experienced the emotional event, they recorded very high blood levels of stress hormones, including adrenaline. In fact, the levels were two to three times higher than those in a heart attack victim, and seven to 34 times above those of healthy people. Some were placed on life support to keep their, their blood circulating. Patients diagnosed, diagnosed with the condition were, were all previously healthy and had no history of heart disease. Blood tests showed normal levels of topopin, an enzyme released when cells are damaged in a heart attack. Most important, all recovered and magnetic resonance imaging of the hearts indicated no permanent damage. Stress can increase the risk of coronary heart disease, the leading cause of death in many developed countries. It has been linked with competitive, hard driving, uh, impatient type A personality. The toxic core of type A is the negative emotions, typically the anger associated with aggressively reactive temperament. Under stress, the body of the type A person secretes more hormones that, that that accelerate the buildup of plaques in the heart disease artery walls. The non-competitive, relaxed, easygoing type B personality is less physiologically reactive when harassed or given a difficult challenge and less susceptible to coronary heart disease. 
Pessimism and depression can also have a toxic effect on person's health. Pessimistic adult men are twice as likely to develop heart disease over a 10-year period. Psychophysiological illness refers to any stress-related physical illnesses such as hypertension and some headaches. These real illnesses differ for a hypochondriasis in which people may interpret, misinterpret normal physical sensations as symptoms of disease. The secretion of stress hormones suppress the immune system's white blood cells called lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are important in fighting bacterial infections. T lymphocytes fight cancer cells, viruses, and foreign substances. Another agent of the immune system is the microphage. When animals are physically restrained, given unavoidable electric shocks, or subjected to noise, crowding, cold water, social defeat, or ma maternal separation, they became more susceptible to, to disease. Studies suggest the stress similarly depresses the human immune system, making us more vulnerable to illness. People with the highest life stress scores were also the most vulnerable when exposed to experimental cold viruses. Stress and negative emotions correlate with the progression of HIV infection to AIDS and with the speed and decline of those infected. Efforts to reduce stress also help somewhat control the disease. Educational initi initiatives, bereavement support groups, and cognitive therapy exercise programs that reduce distress have all had positive consequences for HIV positive individuals. Stress does not create cancer cells. Researchers disagree on whether stress influences the progression of cancer. However, they do agree that avoiding stress and having a hopeful attitude can reverse advanced cancer. If the immune system can be suppressed through conditioning, researchers believe that immune enhancing responses can be inculcated to combat viral diseases. Although stress does not produce uh, a large Swedish study found that people with the history of workplace stress had greater risk of colon cancer than those who reported no such problems. Although a relaxed, hopeful attitude may enhance the body's defenses against few proliferating cancer cells, merely maintaining a determined attitude is not likely to derail the powerful biological forces at work in advanced cancer. Experiments show that conditioning can influence the immune system's responses. For example, after researchers associated sweetened water with the drug that causes the immune suppression, the inert substance alone triggered the immune response. Such conditioned immune suppression can triple an animal's likelihood of growing a tumor when fed a carcinogen. Current research seeks to determine whether it's also possible to condition the immune system to enhance it. Promoting health is generally defined as the absence of disease. We only think of health when we are diseased. However, the health psychologists say that promoting health begins by preventing illness and enhancing well-being, which is constant endeavor. Reducing stress can be changing events that cause stress by changing how we react to stress is called problem-focused coping. We cope with stress by finding emotional, cognitive, or behavioral ways to alleviate it. Through problem-focused coping, we attempt to alleviate stress by changing the stressor or the way we interact with the stressor. We tend to use problem-focused strategies when we think we can change the situation or at least change ourselves to more capably deal with the situation. Through emotion-focused coping, we can attempt to alleviate stress by avoiding or ignoring the stressor and attending to emotional needs related to our stress reaction. 
we tend to use emotion focused strategies when we believe we cannot change a situation. Rats that experience uncontrollable shock are more susceptible to ulcers and experience a lowered immunity to the disease. Both animal and human studies show that the loss of control provokes an outpouring of stress hormones that can contribute to the health problems. Control may help explain the well-established link between economic status and longevity. Although the it is better to practice preventive medicine to behave in ways that are, are, maintain our health. Treating illness is also an important part of promoting health. Shelley Taylor suggests that the health belief model has been the most influential approach to understanding people's actual use of health services. According to this model, two factors predict whether a person will seek tri treatment. The, the degree to which the person receives perceives a threat to his or her health, and two, the degree to which he or she believes that a particular health measure will be effective in reducing that threat. Perceived threat is a function of general health values. For example, my physical health is the most important thing to me. Specific beliefs about one's vulnerability to a particular disorder, for example, polio has not yet been eradicated, and beliefs about the severity of consequences. One's feelings, uh, belief in the efficacy of treatment includes one's feelings that the benefits of seeking treatment exceed the costs. Um, for instance, although polio vaccinations are uncomfortable, they do prevent polio. Uh, Taylor notes that only people who believe that they are susceptible to polio, that the polio has a severe consequences when the vaccination is effective against polio, will go to the health service to be vaccinated. I.K. Zola has identified at least three other triggers that may send a person for treatment. First, an interpersonal crisis that threatens relationship with friends or close relatives may lead the patient to seek help. For example, if a husband is always tired, his wife may insist he do something about his constant fatigue. Second, social interference may lead to action. For example, symptoms that threaten valued activities such as taking of a vacation may prompt one to seek treatment. Finally, social sanctioning, such as when an employer insists that the symptomatic individual either seek treatment or return to work, treatment or return to work and may lead the employee to finally seek help. Optimism and pessimism influence stress vulnerability. Those with an optimistic explanatory style perceive more control, cope, and better with stressful events and enjoy better health. In comparison to pessimists, optimists report less fatigue, have fewer aches and pains, respond to stress with smaller and increases in blood pressure. Optimists also tend to outlive pessimists. Laughter but not hostile sarcasm, may reduce stress and strengthen the immune system. Susan Folkman and Judith Tedley Moskowitz observed that even in the midst of acute chronic stress, people experience positive emotion. In monitoring gay men who were primarily caregivers of partners with AIDS for up to five years, they found that the caregivers reported positive and negative moods equally. So how could they experience positive emotions during such a difficult circumstance? Folkman and Moskowitz identified the following three important classes of coping mechanisms. Positive reappraisal is a cognitive process in which people focus on the good and what is happening or what has happened. The meaning of a situation can change as people perceive personal growth, growth and recognize how their own efforts can benefit other people. In studying AIDS-related caregiving, such positive reappraisal was associated with positive emotion during both caregiving and after the death of the partner. Problem-focused coping involves thoughts and instrumental behaviors that manage or, or solve the underlying cause of distress. Although such coping is usually considered maladaptive, there is no personal control. 
study of caregivers highlighted that even situations that appear uncontrollable may still have controllable aspects. For example, in the weeks prior to the partner's death, a period of profound lack of control, the caregivers often created the to-do list that is performing seemingly mundane tasks such as getting prescription filled or changing the partner's bed linen. Such trivial tasks foster feelings of efficacy. The caregiver often benefited from the positive feedback from his partner or from others involved in the partner's care. Creation of the positive events involves infusing ordinary events with positive meaning, reflecting on the compliment that was offered in passing or pausing to take note of the beautiful sunset caregiver notes remembered positive events in the midst of someone's life's most trying circumstance. These events may not even have been noticed in less stressful times. In fact, the caregivers not only noted such events when they occurred serendipitously, but they also often deliberately created them. Such humor not only proved, proved tension reducing, but only but often build social bonds in the darkest moments. Supportive family members, marriage partners, and close friends help people cope with stress. Their immune functioning calms the cardiovascular systems and lower blood pressure. Feeling liked, affirmed, and encouraged by intimate friends and family promotes both happiness and health. People with supportive friends and marriage partners eat better, exercise more, sleep better, and smoke less. Thus, they cope with stress more effectively. Social support strengthens immune functioning, calms the cardiovascular system, and lowers blood pressure. Even companionable pets help people cope with stressful events. Sheldon Cohen identifies three important social factors of variables that affect our social health social support, social integration, and negative interactions. Each influence health through a different mechanism. Social support refers to a social network's provision of psychological and material resources. It includes instrument, instrumental support, which the provision of material aid and informational support, which is giving the advice and guidance in dealing with life's problems and emotional support which is offering empathy, caring, and reassurance. Social support affects health by buffering the effects of stress. More specifically, social support eliminates or reduces the effects of stressful experiences by providing less threatening interpretations of adverse events and effective coping strategies. The most important factor in social support operating as a stress buffer, argues Cohen, is the perception that others will provide appropriate aid. Having someone lend you money may be helpful in the face of an unexpected unemployment, but useless in the death of a friend. Support may reduce the effect of stress by providing a solution to the problem by reducing the perceived importance of the problem, or by providing the distraction from the problem. Cohen notes that social support sometimes fosters healthful behaviors such as exercise, personal hygiene, proper nutrition, and rest. Social integration is defined as the participation in broad range of social relationships. As a multidimensional construct, it is thought to include behavioral component, active engagement in a wide range of social activities or relationships, and a cognitive component a sense of purpose, belonging, and identification with one's social roles. Social connectedness is beneficial to physical health whether or not one is under stress. For example, social networks may influence whether people exercise, are on low-fat diets, smoke, or take illicit drugs. Social interaction aids in emotional regulation by increasing positive effect and helping to limit the intensity and duration of negative effect, affective states. These positive cognitions and emotions are thought to be beneficial because they reduce psychological despair and even result in greater motivation to care for oneself. Furthermore, having a wide range of social networks provides multiple sources of information that could result in more effective use of health-relevant behaviors and help one to avoid stressful or high-risk situations. Evidence suggests that social integration influences health 
regardless of whether people are facing adversity. Many studies have found that healthy adults who are more socially integrated belong to social, uh, are married, have close family and friends, belong to social and religious groups, li live longer. Studies also indicate that the greater integration predicts survival from heart attacks, less risk from cancer recurrence, and less depression and anxiety, and less severe cognitive decline with aging. Finally, social relationships can facilitate the spread of disease and the opportunity for conflict exploitation. Stress transmission, misguided attempts to help in ultimately feelings of loss and loneliness. Negative interactions can be an important source of stress and illness. For example, Cohen and his colleagues found that people involved in serious, enduring, one month or longer conflicts were more susceptible to illness. When research participants were exposed to a virus that causes the common cold, those with the enduring conflicts were more than twice as likely to develop a cold as were persons without any chronic stressors in their lives. The conflicts that contributed to this increased susceptibility included problems with spouses, close family members, and friends. More generally, Cohen's research indicates that social environments and one's response to them can have a powerful detrimental effect. He suggests that adverse effect is mediated through one's appraisal of social conditions as stressful, which is, is, which is then followed by changes in health behaviors and the endocrine and immune cardiovascular response systems. <clears throat> now, um, on the value of pets, the Karen Allen's review of the literature it, it shows that uh, Allen's most important conclusions about social support, its buffering effects depend on the relationship between the support needed and the ability to avail of the available supports to fill the need. For example, when people need complete positive regard, pets are clearly preferred. In contrast to people, they are never judgmental. Pets can even have social facilitation effect. They allow people to relax, elicit the best from their owners, much as cheering, crowd fosters, and athletes' performance. Allen's findings that the women's blood pressure increased as they struggled with the math problems in the presence of a best friend or even a spouse and it increased much less when they were accompanied by their dog. You might add that research per participants actually perform, performed the, the math task better and faster when their pets were present than when their spouses were present. Allen also points in the direction for further research. Studies have not yet examined how the presence of pets may add stress to the lives of some people nor have they examined the physiological consequences of the death of a pet with whom strong bonds have been built. Finally, we know little about the potential benefits of, of species other than cats and dogs. <laughs> Aerobic exercise, sustained exercise, increase heart and lung fitness, and can reduce stress, depression, and anxiety. It's... <clears throat> It strengthens the heart, increases blood flow, and keeps blood vessels open, lowers both blood pressure and the blood pressure reaction to stress. Depression and anxiety. Research has linked aerobic exercise to higher levels of neurotransmitters that boost moods to enhance cognitive abilities and to the growth of brain cells in mice. One estimate suggests that moderate exercise adds two years to one's expected life. So can a, so biofeedback, a system of recording and amplifying. So can aerobic exercise boost spirits? Many studies suggest that aerobic exercise can elevate mood, well-being, and because aerobic exercising Exercises raises energy, increase self-confidence, and lowers tension, depression, and anxiety. Biofeedback, a system of recording and amplifying and feeding back information about subtle 
physiological response this enables people to control specific physiological responses. Research suggests that biofeedback works best on tension headaches. Simpler methods of relaxation produce many techniques same benefits. For example, research indicates that the relaxation procedures can help alleviate headaches, hypertension, anxiety, and insomnia. In a type A heart attack survivors, relaxation lowers rates of recurring heart attacks. Those experienced in meditation assume a comfortable position, breathe deeply, relax their muscles, close their eyes, and focus on simple repeated phrase. The activity is associated with increased left frontal lobe activity, improved immune functioning. Complementary and alternative medicine practices such as homeopathy, acupuncture, and herbal medicines are bound to seem effective whether or not they are. People are likely to employ them when they are ill, and although they may seem to produce improvement, the return to health may merely reflect the body's natural return to normal. Alternative medicine may seem especially effective with cyclical diseases as people seek therapy during the downturn, downturn and presume its effectiveness during the ensuing upturn. The placebo effect, as well as the spontaneous remission of many diseases, may also contribute to treatment of perceived effectiveness. The actual effectiveness of the alternative medicine needs to be established. Research indicates that those who attend religious services regularly live as many as eight years longer than non-attenders. Investigators who attempt to explain the relationship have isolated three intervening variables. Religi religiously active people have healthier lifestyles. For example, they smoke and drink less. Faith communities provide social support networks, often encourage marriage, which, is, which when happy is linked with better health and longer lifespan. Religious attendance is often accompanied by coherent worldview, a sense of hope for future and feelings of acceptance and, relax, and a relaxed meditative state. These may enhance feelings of positive emotions and de decrease feelings of stress and anxiety. The text, uh, although Freud viewed religion to be a form of pathology, an obsessional neurosis that developed out of feelings of infantile helplessness, many other psychologists disagree. Carl Jung, Freud's student, stated that spirituality was an important element in psychological health and argued that he could heal only those middle-aged people who embraced a spiritual or religious perspective toward life. William James and Gordon Allport, Eric Fromm, Viktor Frankl, Abraham Maslow, Rollo May, also have made spirituality a major focus of their work. Today's clinical psychologists vary widely on their views of the role of religion in their patients' mental health. When Edward Shransky and Newton Maloney surveyed 409 members of the American Psychological Association about their approach toward religion and psychology, Nearly all the respondents said they have assessed clients' religious backgrounds. In addition, 57% have used religious language or concepts with clients. 36% have recommended participation in religion. 32% have re recommended religious or spiritual books. 24 have prayed privately for a patient. And 7% have prayed with a client. Family physicians seem to be in greater agreement on the benefits of religion and physical health. As the text indicates, a 1997 survey of family physicians found that 99% believed that prayer and meditation or other spiritual religious practices can be helpful in medical treatment. And more than half said they incorporated relaxation or meditation techniques into their treatment of patients. Linda Powell and Leela Shahabi and Carl Thorelson recently reviewed evidence for nine specific hypotheses regarding the link between religion, spirituality, and health. Hypothesis one, 
Church service attendance protects against disease. There is strong and consistent evidence supporting the hypothesis with a certain with 30% reduction in mortality risk after adjustment for democratic, demographic, socioeconomic, and health-related co-founders and approximately a 25% reduction in risk after adjustment for established risk factors. Hypothesis two, religion or spirituality protects against cardiovascular disease. Findings suggest that some aspects of religion, most likely weekly attendance at church services, protects against cardiovascular disease, and that its benefit may be largely mediated by the effect of religion or spirituality on a healthy lifestyle. Hypothesis three, religion or spirituality protects against cancer mortality. At this time, evidence supporting this claim is inadequate. Hypothesis four, deeply religious people are protected against death. Investigations claim that reviewers have consistently failed to support this hypothesis as well. Hypothesis five, religion or spirituality protects against disability. Currently, there is inadequate support for this claim. The reviewers suggest that more consistency may be observed if the focus shifts to the elderly who have some pre-existing disability. Hypothesis six, religion or spirituality slows progression of cancer. Research has consistently failed to support this claim. Hypothesis seven, people who use religion to cope with difficulties live longer. The evidence uh, on this is inadequate. Hypothesis eight, religion or spirituality improves recovery from acute illness. The lit literature also consistently fails to support this hypothesis. If anything, evidence suggests that religion may actually impede recovery from acute illness. Hypothesis nine, being prayed for improves physical recovery from acute illness. There is some evidence to support this claim. The absence of clearly plausible biological mechanism by which prayer could influence a medical outcome leads to skeptical, skepticism in results. Self-conscious adolescents may begin smoking to imitate cool, uh, cool models to receive the social reward of being accepted by them. The smoking habit is hard to break because the craving and irritability that accompany nicotine withdrawal of are aversive and states that a cigarette relieves. Nicotine also boosts alertness and stimulates the central nervous system to release neurotransmitters that calm anxiety and reduce pain sensitivity. They influence one's propensity to cigarette addiction. Twin studies indicate 60% heritability in regards to smoking. The elimination of smoking would increase life expectancy more than any other preventative measure. People smoke because it is socially re rewarding. Smoking is also a result of genetic factors. Nic nicotine takes away unpleasant cravings, negative reinforcement by triggering epinephrine and norepinephrine, dopamine and endorphins. Nicotine itself is reporting rewarding positive reinforcement. Efforts to help people stop smoking are often effective only in the short run. Smoking cessation guidelines include setting a quit date, informing a family and friends, and removing all cigarettes, using a nicotine patch or gum, being totally abstinent and avoiding places where others are likely to smoke. Strategies designed to prevent smoking have been more effective. Key ingredients in these programs are important about the effects of smoking. Information about peer, parent, and media influences and training and refusal skills through modeling and role playing. Another way to discourage smoking is to make more immediate, make it more immediately costly like raising taxes.
Raising taxes cuts consumption, especially among teenagers. Prevention programs do have an effect on smoking. Fat is an ideal form of storage energy. Energy it is a high calorie fuel that reserves uh, fuel reserve that can carry the body through periods of famine. In fact, where people face famine, obesity signals affluence and social status. However, the tendency to eat energy rich fat or sugar becomes dysfunctional in a world where food is easily accessible. Combined with a lack of exercise, the abundance of high Calorie food has led to higher rates of obesity, which raise the risk of illness and shortens life expectancy. Obesity in children increases the risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, disease, gallstones, arthritis, and certain types of cancer, thus shortening their life expectancy. The death rate is high among very overweight men. When women applicants were made to look overweight, subjects were less willing to hire them. Obesity affects how you are treated and how you feel about yourself. Obese people, especially obese women, experience weight discrimination in job hiring, placement, promotion, uh, compensation, discipline, and discharge. Similarly, these experience bias in searching for their romantic relationships and in interacting with family members. In studies of patients who were especially unhappy with their weight and who had undergone intestinal bypass surgery, four and five said the children had asked them not to attend school functions. Fat cells are 30 to 40 million fat. There are 40 million 30 to 40 million fat cells in the body. These cells can increase in size or increase in number, uh, 75 million in an obese individual. Studies of twins and adopted children reveal a genetic influence on weight. For example, people's weights resemble those of their biological parents and their identical twins have similar weights even when reared apart. Although genes influence body weight, they do not determine it. Some people are genetically predisposed to have more and larger fat cells than others, but in an obese person, the original fat cells double or triple in size and then divide, which is irreversible environmental effect. People also differ in their resting metabolic rates, but once someone gains fat tissue, less energy is needed to maintain that tissue than is needed to maintain muscle tissue. Finally, the genetic influence on weight is complex because it is governed by many different genes. Unquestionably, environmental factors such as often eating high caloric foods and living a sedentary lifestyle also matter as comparisons of similar people from different generations and different locations indicate. When reduced from 3,500 calories to 450 calories, weight loss was minimal, only 6%, and the metabolic rate a mere 15%. Identical twin studies reveal body weight has a genetic basis. The obese mouse on the left has a defective gene for the hormone leptin. The mouse on the right sheds 40% of its weight when injected with leptin. Lack of exercise is a major contributor to ob obesity. Just watching TV for two hours resulted in a 23% increase of weight when other factors were controlled. Over the past 40 years, average weight gain has increased. Health professionals are pleading with the United States citizens to limit their food intake. Although cigarette smoking has declined over the years, American obesity is on the rise. 
In the U.S., two-thirds of women and half the men say they want to lose weight. The majority of them lose money on diet programs. Research indicates that most people who succeed on a weight loss program eventually regain most of the weight. Obesity is difficult to overcome because the number of fat cells is not reduced by diet because the energy expenditure necessary for tissue maintenance is lower in fat than in other tissues and because overall metabolic rate decreases when the body weight drops below its set point. Altering the environment. For example, by taxing junk food, weight drops below it. Uh, by taxing junk food and using revenues to finance health supportive nutritional advertising as well as designing community with walks and bike paths may be one strategy for reducing obesity. Those who wish to diet should minimize exposure to food cues, boost energy expenditure through exercise, set realistic goals, eat healthy foods spaced throughout the day, and make a lifelong change in eating patterns and set realistic goals. Cheryl Simon reports that the odds are overwhelming, 9 to 1, that dieters who have lost weight will gain it back. Once the goal of losing weight is reached, people often return to their old eating habits. To maintain weight loss, dieters must permanently change the way they eat. Thus, many weight control therapists are now developing strategies for maintenance dieting. Their advice to successful dieters includes the following. Convince yourself that this diet is different from previous ones. We try to help people see that, that making a lifelong commitment, says psych psychologist Michael Perry. Barbara Steinberg, who developed the behavioral component of the Weight Watchers International Program, cautions, don't treat weight loss as something you can do every month or two. Ask yourself, how am I going to make this diet the last diet? Two, develop substitutes for the, pla for the place dieting occupied in your social interactions. While you're losing weight, you're often reinforced by friends and relatives who say, wow, you look terrific. After the pounds are lost, this reinforcement soon ends. Fill the gap, re recommends Steinberg, with other sources of satisfaction, a new hobby and interest that builds self-esteem. Regular exercise is the best maintenance strategy. It boosts energy expenditure, reduces lean tissue loss during weight loss, and counteracts the slowing metabolic rate that comes with dieting. In addition, exercise can provide a new positive focus for relationships. Accept this challenge of low-fat cooking. Find creative substitutes for examples. Master a high-taste but low-fat cuisine, such as Japanese cooking. Keep fat intake to no more than 30% of total calories. Low-fat foods with high-fat pleasure quotient include chocolate syrup. Measures only 11% calories from fat, only 47 calories per tablespoon. Cream soda, only 100 calories per 8-ounce serving. The diet cream soda is even better. Its intense vanilla flavor leads us to associate it with eggnog and ice cream. Frozen low-fat yogurt. Its uh, smoothie, creamy texture leads us to associate it with more fatty foods. Fresh baked bread tastes smooth, uh, great without butter, and its compelling aroma stimulates the olfactory receptors such as high-fat flavors are novel. Taste tolerance is one factor that makes garden-variety foods boring. Don't abandon the strategies that made your diet succeed. For example, if a 10-minute walk after dinner or recording food intake was especially helpful while you were losing weight, stay with it. Keeping records is an especially useful tool because it helps maintain awareness. Research indicates that the initial slips fall into two general categories. About 50% occur when a diet is in a negative mood, feeling anxiety, boredom, or depression. Uncontrolled eating is an especially common response to such moods when a person is alone. Another 50% of first slips are related to interpersonal factors. For example, to parties where social pressure is high and one's guard is down. To avoid these slips, dieters should anticipate moods and situations that make them vulnerable. When you're actually in the situation, it's not the time to start thinking about how you're going to cope. 
Steinberg says, if you can think about when you're most likely to be tempted, you can distract yourself in advance. Take a walk, telephone a friend, whatever you enjoy. If leaving isn't an option, such as when you're at a friend's buffet dinner, decide before you get there how you're going to stay in control around all that food. For instance, decide to help yourself to a little salad. That way you can take the edge off your hunger and rest to the buffet won't be quite as big a temptation. When you are motivated to lose weight, begin a weight loss program, minimize your exposure to tempting foods, ex exercise and forgive yourself lapses. Other medical ways of achieving health is there are alternative systems of medical practice. Um, bioelectrical magne magnetic, the study of living organisms interact with electromagnetic fields, diet, nutrition, lifestyle changes, the knowledge of how to prevent illness, maintain health and reverse the effect of chronic disease through dietary or nutritional health. Herbal medicines, employing plant and medical products from folk medicine traditions and pharmacological use. Manual healing, using touch and manipulation with hands as a diagnostic therapeutic tool. Mind-body control, exploring the mind's capacity to affect the body based on traditional medical systems that make use of interconnectedness of the mind and body. Pharmacological biological treatments, drugs and vaccines not yet accepted by the mainstream medicine. This concludes chapter 14 on stress and health. I hope you've enjoyed it.